The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining our Pediatric SPIN webinar, Who's Afraid of Pediatric Nephrology? My name is Susan Stevens, and I'm the Pediatric SPIN leader. And I'm here with Terry Bizio, who is our best practice advisor. Hi there. <laughs> so uh, we also have on the call, but they're presently muted, but we'll be unmuted later on, Barbara, who is our um, education advisor, Yvette and Nanita, our publication advisor. They'll be available at the end of the webinar to answer any questions and provide some interesting stories and experiences. So we're really glad that you guys are here and uh, let's get started. We have several objectives for our webinar today. Um, our title, um, Who's Afraid of Pediatric Nephrology? Um, we really wanted to um, discuss the nurses' fears. I, I think you, having a healthy fear of pediatrics is, is good. It's different, it's a different science. We will share some statistics of pediatric CKD. We'll point out some causes of CKD in pediatric patients versus adult nephrology patients. Um, we'll identify the interdisciplinary team. There's a few different um, team members on the pediatric team. We'll share key differences in pediatric and adult patients. We'll share some patient assessment tools and some um, other ideas on how to assess your patients. And lastly, we'll, we'll end with the challenges and the rewards of this um, um, great um, segment of nephrology. And one last thing, we want to offer you all support and resources. That was the basic premise of this talk. So caring for pediatric patients can be scary, especially if you're not used to the small people. Um, we as a team, our PED spin, want you to help recognize these fears and to, to develop resources. We're here for you. Many, I think most of the people on our spin team have cared for adult uh, nephrology patients, so they know exactly what you're going through. We have a wealth of experience and knowledge ready to help you. So what are some of those fears? You're not familiar with pediatric patients, learning the different normals. Uh, you know, pediatric patients have different heart rate norms and blood pressure norms. The availability of medical equipment. Is your crash cart equipped with small ET tubes? Um, figure out Figuring out dosing for the medications and dialysis is all weight-based. Um, there are hemodynamic differences. Uh, many pediatric patients, their heart rate and blood pressure may go up before they crash. So different key subtle differences um, occur. And lastly, staffing ratios. Pediatric units staff a lot differently than the adult units. I know here at Children's Hospital in Colorado, we don't have patient care checks, but some end-stage renal disease licensing regulations prohibit patient care checks from caring for patients under 35 kilos. Other staffing ratios, if the patient is 10 kilos, it's one-to-one, uh, -one, or if they're in isolation, it's one-to-one. -one. Patients weighing from between 10 to 20 kilos the staffing ratio is one to two, and patients greater than 20, the staffing ratio is one to three. I found some statistics from articles over the last three years. Um, End-stage renal disease in children is very rare, and the prevalence at this point is about 8,500 children in the United States, but fewer than 3,000 pediatric patients are on dialysis. Um, I think this is very interesting because that, that number above could change because 1,500 children develop um, end-stage renal disease annually in the United States. This is a statistic that I found very astounding, that only half of children living in the U.S. receive care in pediatric dialysis facilities. The rest um, receive their dialysis care in adult facilities due to where they live. There's such wide ge geographic distribution, and not every um, patient can move you know, to a big um, city center where there is a pediatric dialysis facility. I found um, that in um, the end stage network 10 in Illinois in 2016 cited that out of 227 children being dialyzed, 182, which is 80%, were treated in non-pediatric facilities. So 
if you adults and nephrology nurses are out there, we want to be a resource to you to help to help you and and to help these patients. Here's another astounding statistic: that pediatric dialysis units make up less than 0.1 percent of all dialysis units in the United States. CKD is more common in males due to the higher frequency of K cut. K cut stands for congenital anomalies of the kidney and urinary tract. And in North America, African American children are two to three times more likely to develop CKD compared to Caucasian um, children, regardless whether they're a boy or a girl. So what are some of the etiologies of end-stage renal disease in pediatric patients? Like Terry just mentioned, the K-cut, the congenital anomalies of kidneys and urinary tract, account for the largest proportion of kids um, that develop end-stage renal disease in the younger population. So situations such as renal agenesis, posterior urethral valve, um, those are common things that we would see for the K-cut. Whereas glomerular nephritis, that predominates in children greater than 12. So you have your steroid-resistant nephrotic syndrome, that accounts for 10.4%. Chronic glomerular nephritis, like lupus, is 8.1%. And other renal ciliopathies is 5.3%. It's also interesting to note that there's other conditions, such as uh, small for gestational age newborns or um, uh, low birth weight patients have uh, minor reductions in the number of their nephrons, which predisposes them to CKD. The other um, epidemic that's occurring here in America is pediatric obesity. It's a significant predisposer to CKD. I came from an adult acute dialysis unit over 30 years ago, and these are the patients I saw, and these are the most common etiologies in adult um, ESRD patients, diabetes, hypertension, and cardiovascular disease. So who makes up our pediatric interdisciplinary team? Similar to the adults, you're gonna have the nephrologist, dialysis nurse, social worker, dietitian, patient care tech, obviously the patient and the parent or guardian. But other um, key players in this interdisciplinary team are child life specialists. We have a fascinating speaker who's gonna be um, presenting at our ANNA conference. Uh, she is a child life specialist from Orlando um, and they're lucky that they have a child life specialist. We have them here at the hospital, but they don't come to our unit. But we do, however, have teachers. So we, the hospital provides a paid teacher that comes to our unit three times a week and helps the kids stay on task, helps with homework, tutoring, contacts the school, um, helps with testing. So they're very key players. Psychologists, pediatric urologists, pediatric surgeons, and vascular access surgeons are uh, essential players in our team. There are many key differences, which we'll be discussing um, in, in this order, I guess. Um, growth and development is one. Knowledge of a child's developmental stage from infancy to adolescence is so helpful. I mean, you wouldn't treat a toddler as you would a teenager, et cetera. Blood pressure ranges and taking a blood pressure correctly um, is key. In, um, in assessing these patients. We utilize um, a few different tools in assessing patients, including the PALS, which stands for Pediatric Advanced Life Support Vital Sign Parameters. And there are many technical aspects that differ when prescribing H HD and PD on a child. Um, in HD, um, that would be a child with a smaller blood volume who would need smaller tubing and a smaller dialyzer. And in peritoneal dialysis, you would adjust the treatment um, based on that patient's size. Your equipment will be slightly different. You can make um, different adjustments to um, apply to the pediatric patient. Vascular access and peritoneal access is very, very important. Um, we want to optimize these accesses for as long as possible. And you can do that by preventing infection in both, like I said, the HD and the PD accesses. Fistulas and grafts are the ideal vascular access and usually placed in a child greater than 20 kilos, although I bet there's some centers out there that have placed um, a fistula or graft in a, you know, in a slightly um, smaller child. A CVC, especially in the internal jugular vein, is acceptable in a child greater than 20 kilos. 
in our center, we transplant kids rather quickly, um, almost under a year. So we do have a lot of um, CBCs. If your area of the, of the country lacks surgical expertise, um, this may be an issue and they may need to actually go to a pediatric center because placement and location is a real important consideration. Um, vascular accesses should support a blood flow rate, and I don't expect you to remember this math, but maybe refer to it later, but your blood flow rate should be three to five mLs per kilo per minute. And on the um, monitoring side, it's very important to um, monitor your vascular access um, for stenosis and other complications. It's also important to monitor your peritoneal dialysis access for um, infection. Your quality of life metrics will differ in pediatrics as well. I mean, kids are about play, going to school, making friends. So um, their quality of life um, differs from that of an adult. So we're gonna break down each of these key differences um, and talk about them individually. So obviously growth and development, that's huge for our pediatric patients. It's interesting that growth during infancy and early childhood is reliant on nutrition, whereas um, during mid-childhood or prepubertal, it's more reliant on hormones. Our greatest longitudinal growth occurs within the first two years of life. So if you have a patient that develops in stage renal disease at birth or within those first two years, they are going to be um, shorter in statute despite normal growth velocity greater in, in, in their life. With the advent of growth hormone, it's been a very effective uh, medication to help achieve maximum growth potential. And with the help of our dietitians, they help uh, determine when a patient is eligible for growth hormone. They help us to determine, is our patient at their estimated dry weight? Sometimes it can be a little tricky. Is this fluid or is this the normal growth occurring? Is that why their weight's kind of creeping up? Dietitians are also uh, very important to help with the infant and enteral formulas, to provide nutritional supplements to our patients that are caloric dense while maintaining fluid restrictions. Um, they uh, um, help to um, prescribe and suggest our liquid fill and our suplena for patients that have minimal or reduced uh, protein intake. The next uh, step is, uh, is determining differences in blood pressure ranges and taking blood pressure correctly. There was an excellent article in 2019 by the American Academy of Pediatrics, and their article was titled The Clinical Practice Guidelines for Screening and Management of High Blood Pressure in Children and Adolescents. They broke down um, what we should be expecting for different um, disease entities, and they have these graphs based on age, sex, and height. The goal for end-stage renal disease patients is to have their blood pressure less than the 90th percentile in children's ages 1 to 13. Um, and for children's greater than 13, their blood pressure should be less than 120 over 80. In our center, we try to establish best practices for blood pressure measurement. Probably our biggest challenge is to get the child to sit quietly for three to five minutes. Um, it's a challenge because they, they love to chat with each other. Um, we like to measure blood pressure with their back supported and their feet uncrossed on the floor if they can even reach the floor. It's important to measure, you know, we like to use the right arm for consistency, but if you have a fistula in your right arm, use the same um, arm every time. Um, we measure length and width to determine the correct blood pressure cuff size. The gold standard is oscillating a blood pressure. Um, it is the most accurate. Um, we use a lot of oscillometric readings though, and um, the mean arterial pressure is used, um, they use an internal logarithm to determine the systolic and diastolic blood pressure. We oftentimes, we're doing a study where we will do two oscillometric blood pressures. If they're greater than the 90 percentile, we will then oscillate a blood pressure. And sometimes we see a 10 point difference. So how do we determine the correct blood pressure size? We just recently started uh, measuring for accuracy, and we're going to start doing this every six months. So the way you do this, again, this 
reference and how to do this is in that article that I mentioned from the American Academy of Pediatrics. But you locate um, the acromion process, which is that little bump on top of your arm next to your shoulder, which you see in picture A. And then from there, you take a tape measure down to the tip of your elbow. That information, you can determine where is the midpoint of their arm. Then you take the circumference of the arm there. The bladder length of the blood pressure cuff should cover that arm 80 to 100%. And then the width of the blood pressure cuff should be 40% of the circumference. So there's a little math involved, but I think it's very important to have the proper size so we're measuring the proper blood pressure. Um, this is yet another assessment tool, the Pediatric Advanced Life Support Vital Sign um, chart right here. Um, as opposed to the clinical practice guideline that Susan mentioned, which is maybe a little more refined based on age, sex, and height. It's important when you dialyze children to note their baseline vital signs. Um, vital signs are very important when you're um, dialyzing a child, but sometimes they're not the only indicator of a patient's status. What if your patient is crying because they're cramping and in pain? What if it's a baby that needs a diaper change? Or what if they're just not tolerating the dialysis treatment. Here is a picture of several different blood pressure cuff sizes from um, the neonate on the bottom to the large adult cuff on the top. So as Susan mentioned earlier, um, dialyzer size tubing, the, the blood pump segment, and other adjustments and customizations are really important in you know, developing a safe treatment for the child. First you, um, well, I wanted to mention, these are the three different tubings that we use in our center. Note that the neonate prime volume is 29, pediatric volume 73, and the adult tubing prime volume is 142. So there's some great differences there. So what you need to do is first estimate what their the child's blood volume. And the math you use is you multiply 70 times a patient's dry weight. So let's say we have a 10 kilo patient times 70. Their estimated blood volume is 700 ml. And to achieve um, a safe dialysis using less than 8 to 10 percent of the child's estimated blood volume, that would be approximately 70 ml that you would want outside this child's body when you're trying to achieve a safe hemodialysis treatment. These are the different dialyzers we use in our unit from the F30 on the bottom, which is only 29 ml, on up to the F200, which is 112 ml. So you need a wide variety of supplies to create this safe extracorporeal dialysis circuit. So we use small and large dialyzers and tubing to achieve the best and most adequate dialysis clearance. And our other goal is to do this without complications, such as hypotension and clotting. We used to carry more dialyzers in our center, but either the manufacturer no longer carries them or um, we just wanted to simplify. But some manufacturers discontinue products simply due to the high cost and low demand. You have to keep tabs on your expiration dates because how often will you use an F3 dialyzer? You might use it for a chronic patient or you might use it for an acute patient. So what do you do with the five kilo patient? Who, um, let's take five kilos, multiply that times 70, you get an estimated blood volume of 350. To determine the extracorporeal volume, that would be 10% of 350, which is 35. I don't have a small enough dialyzer or tubing to dialyze this patient safely. So what we do is after the dialyzer, and you know, we can use the smallest, and after the dialyzer is primed with saline, we just place that saline with a blood prime. So you basically just place the saline with packed red blood cells that have been um, diluted with saline in the blood bank, or perhaps whole blood. It's, the physician determines that. But can't stress enough that the extracorporeal volume um, is important in your prescription when choosing tubing and dialyzers because hemodynamic changes. Um, can occur and they can occur quickly. And those are all determined by your vital signs, continuous monitoring, as well as behavioral changes in the nonverbal child. 
So another piece of equipment that may be unique for pediatric patients, I'm not sure if the adult world are, are using these crit lines. They're a great um, monitor that uh, it, it, what you have to do is screw this extra little piece onto your dialyzer and then the monitor is clipped on to that extra piece. But it gives you a minute to minute um, real time evaluation of fluid management by evaluating the percent change in blood volume, oxygen saturations, and hematocrit. So if you have a patient that has an AV fistula, their oxygen saturations are going to be closer to 90 or above versus, because that's going to be arterial um, mixed blood versus a, a patient with a CV catheter where your saturations are going to be you know, 60 to 70 percent. It's very important to pay close attention to your saturations because as we're stressing their bodies out and we're pulling more fluid off, those saturations are going to drop. And if we stress them out too much, you know, they're going to have some symptoms. So um, key interventions that you can do is lay the patient back, provide some oxygen, maybe reduce your ultrafiltration rate. Bear in mind that the crit line is only a piece of a puzzle. You obviously have to take a look at your patient to determine you know, what interventions are needed. It's really pretty cool that there's different um, profiles that kind of help you determine how well your patient is tolerating dialysis. So in this profile A, it looks like maybe this patient were not pulling enough fluid off, or maybe the patient um, has adequate urine output and removing fluid isn't as key as cleaning or dialyzing their blood. Um, profile B is one that we see more commonly, and that's a slow, gentle removal of fluid, maintaining that 13 ml per kilo per hour, um, and hopefully preventing any interdialytic symptoms. Profile C, I don't know if you can see it on your screen, but there's a steep um, decline in um, in the slope indicating that the patient may start to experience some symptoms such as lightheadedness, nausea, vomiting, or cramping. If you see a steep decline, you know, are they eating? Um, what's going on? Are we reaching that point in the treatment where we need to back off on the fluid removal? This is um, a picture in, um, before we start talking about peritoneal dialysis, that we as pediatric centers try to be good stewards of their vascular access and their access in general, because as you know, without their access, if they need dialysis, uh, it's not gonna be possible. So like Terry mentioned earlier, we try to preserve the fistula sites for later in life um, if they're gonna be receiving a transplant within a year or so. Uh, this is a picture of a patient who was on dialysis for a very long time, close to 10 years, and he was on peritoneal dialysis, but got an infection, so came to hemo. Back in the day, they put in a lot of subclavian lines. We try not to do subclavian lines anymore because that creates a stenosis in their subclavian vessel. Um, so what they do encourage is internal jugular vessels, like Terry mentioned. But because this patient was on dialysis for so long, he had multiple, multiple lines. Finally, uh, at the age of eight or nine, he developed this, they surgically created this AV fistula that lasted him for a good six years until he got his transplant. But um, that was very fortunate. And he developmentally, he was able to tolerate it. You may need some child life to help you um, with the little kids putting in needles. But this, this is just an example that we are very conscientious. They're, they're renal patients for life, and, and we know that and respect that. So the use of hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis may vary per institution, but peritoneal dialysis is the treatment of choice for children with end-stage renal disease, especially infants and small children. There are several advantages. You can more readily reach a steady state fluid and biochemical control simply because these children dialyze every single night. There is some freedom from dietary and fluid restrictions, but not totally. The ease of peritoneal dialysis, um, there's technical ease in achieving this form of dialysis. The family and the child may have more independence and a better quality of life because they're not coming to a clinic or the hospital, you know, three times, three, four, or five times a week. 
I have some patients that use less antihypertensive medications. As a child grows and the peritoneal membrane changes, that may require you to tweak the treatments. And we're always tweaking um, dwell times, the number of cycles, the number of hours. Um, we dialyze a patient so that we can achieve adequate dialysis. But there are some risks of peritoneal dialysis, peritonitis being the main risk because that space in the, um, the peritoneal cavity, it's dark, it's moist and we're using dextrose solution, which bacteria just love, love and can thrive in. Constipation is um, another risk of peritoneal dialysis, not only from the dialysis itself, but for, you know, um, due to some of the medications. So a lot of our kids are on bowel programs so that they have a stool um, once a day or at least every other day. And some of our younger patients develop hernias. Perforation is a very rare complication. Um, I haven't seen it in years, and I hope I never see it again. On the left side is um, a manual dialysis setup. I put um, blue food coloring in there, so hopefully you can visualize it a little bit better. It's a closed system, except at some point you need to connect your dianeal solution to your tubing, prime it, and eventually you need to connect your patient, which is the little baby doll there. Um, the system includes, of course, tubing, a little segment that catches air bubbles, the buretrol, which can measure precisely how much fluid goes in. I have a chuck there, but we actually heat the coiled tubing on a K-pad. And then there's a stopcock, which can indicate the direction of fluid flow. So you can control when you drain, when you fill, and when you dwell for the dialysis. If we start, um, when we start perineal dialysis, we use a fill volume of 10 to 15 mLs per kilo. So again, we're gonna do some math. On a two kilo infant, that fill volume would be 20 to 30 mLs. You can't achieve that on the home choice machine, which is in the, in the, the two middle slides. But with using the Buretrol, you can achieve that. And you can actually, um, achieve a, you know, a good dialysis treatment for these infants. Once in our center, I know the home choice machine goes down to 60 ml, but we have found better success when we can at least achieve a fill volume of 100 ml. Baxter also, this is a Baxter machine, and Baxter also um, has manufactured a low recirculation tubing set, which helps to create dead, dead space to help improve adequacy. You basically have, um, less recirculation of the dialysis solution. Another mention, um, you know, with the help of our dietitians, um, we like to feed our kids to help them grow and thrive. Many of our PT PD patients require a G2. Quality of life metrics, um, it's an assessment um, tool that is mandated at six months and then annually on all of our um, peritoneal dialysis patients. And our social worker will do this more often if there's physical changes, like social changes um, that occur. These are the same things that occur to adult patients, hospitalizations, procedures, medical visits, school absences, well, not for adults there, but activity restrictions. You know, they're just frequent events in the life of a child on dialysis. So kids with end-stage renal disease, you know, and this is just a given, have a lower health-related score compared to a healthy child. These scores are affected by their sense that they have no control. They may feel socially isolated and have poor self-esteem. They may lack independence simply because of all their medical needs and they're so dependent on their caregivers. And then they also have uncertainty about the future. I think a child's perspective versus an adult perspective is just different. And it comes with maturity. Here's an example of the PEDS um, L, QL 3.0 and stage renal disease module. Um, different um, modules are used for different age groups, as you can see on the top. Um, there's also an infant module for parents. You know, um, what is their take on how their child is doing? So this consists of 34 different questions in, in seven dimensions. Higher scores indicate a higher quality of life. Again, our social worker um, usually conducts this assessment. But she, you know, shares her findings with the dialysis team, and she also may ask for collaboration with psychologists, school personnel, and other medical personnel. A depression screening is also very important. So we can get these children resources that they need. 
Here's another sample from the QL module. I'm not going to review every single question, but basically, hey, how do you feel? What do you know about kidney disease? Do you feel okay after your treatment? Are you worried about anything? So obviously school is very important and it's our your patients are coming to your dialysis center three, four, sometimes five times a week, they're gonna miss a lot of school, not only for their dialysis treatment, for medical appointments, they don't feel well, um, surgeries, so many things that they miss school for. So absenteeism is huge. Uh, because of the high rate of absenteeism, they fall behind. They have neurocognitive delays that also impact their schooling. They miss out on socialization and after school activities. So our social worker is a good liaison between the school and um, the patient. So they help with uh, individualized educational programs or IEPs. We are lucky here at Children's Hospital, we have a, um, a program called Medical Day where patients that have a lot of medical needs attend school here at the hospital. So it's easy for them to come over to the hospital for appointments, um, help with refills. They also get a lot of psychosocial support during um, school there. And they uh, help accommodate their needs, their physical and mental needs. Um, and we dialyze them and um, you know, schedule their dialysis treatments based on their schooling needs. This is not on the slide, but I wanted to throw this in that um, the provision of comprehensive care to the pediatric dialysis patient is more expensive and sometimes more labor intensive than that to maybe a similar number of adult patients. That's just a given. Kids just require more. Um, but you know, children with end stage renal disease require renal services for decades, as Susan mentioned. So um, we have to provide the best care possible early on um, so that these children have a better chance at a long-term favorable outcome. Now, just looking at our, this is our, one of our last slides, um, challenges and rewards. I'm going to speak on challenges. Um, parents may be shocked when dialysis starts, even if they anticipated it. Balancing the needs of a sick child against the needs of the siblings is a great source of stress guilt and grief. The parents think, what could I have done? How come I didn't detect this? How come my doctor, my PCP didn't figure this out sooner? And then two, let's talk about sibling resentment. Um, if a parent is trying to maintain normalcy and routine within the family, it's a struggle because a child on dialysis is not normal. So these children get jealous. They could act out simply because their parents have to pay more attention to their um, sibling on dialysis. Dealing with chronic illnesses is tough, you know, even outside of chronic renal disease. And caring for ch a child on dialysis places unrelenting responsibility on caregivers. They are the enforcer, the police of their diet and fluid restrictions, their medication adherence, et cetera. Let's talk about the nurses, you know, the, your own emotions, your intuition and your know-how. I don't want to scare you, but what if you're trying to put a child on dialysis and they throw a fit or they're uncooperative um, or they have mood swings that you just don't know how to deal with. Um, a crying infant, how do you assess what's going on? And puberty is no easy thing to deal with either at times. But in our center, we utilize our resources. We have art, music, um, therapists, and we have child life experts. Um, that can come in and help us with this. And then also you, you learn how to deal with children at different stages in life with different personalities, different um, family backgrounds, et cetera. But there are great rewards and these rewards are vast. Yeah, like the relationships that you develop with these patients, like you develop with your adult patients, they're in our center four hours a time, typically for, like I said, between three and five days a week. Just that process of putting them on dialysis and taking them off the of dialysis, you've got that one-on-one -on -one contact connection. So a lot of sharing occurs. They, you know, let you know about their movies, what they did for the weekend, what sporting events they like. They help keep us, you know, young, really. It's, it's quite fun. Um, and we celebrate with them. There's birthday celebrations, graduations, and milestones 
we had a patient that wanted us to help practice interviewing skills, ask them some key interviewing questions. We've had patients that ask us to their wedding, to their quinceanera, to their graduation. Um, we also have camp, which is so fun for these kids. There's a, a local camp here, well, local in the mountains, that is um, for our HD patients because they can uh, go to camp for a couple days, come down for dialysis, and go back up to camp. But it's a YMCA camp that really accommodates to the needs of the patients. We have two, Carrie's one of the main camp nurses that go up and help staff all volunteer so these kids can have a, a taste of what normalcy is like and like we said um, before there's interesting etiologies and treatments that just really make this a fascinating um, um, a job job a fascinating <laughs> job and, and really a lot of fun um, these are some of the resources we used in our webinar, and we invite you to, to look at these. Um, and I know there's a lot more out there. And now we'd like to, I hope we, um, well, first of all, thank you for listening. <laughs> um, I hope we have been of some help, and we want to serve you and help you in the future. And now we'd like to open this up with questions and comments. Thank you so much. We'd also like to see if Barb or Nanita or Yvette have any um, stories that they'd like to share. I think uh, Celeste is going to go ahead and unmute their phone so they can yep. provide any additional yep. things that we may have missed or anything you want to jump in and say. This is Celeste. I'm unmuting them right now. I just unmuted Barb. Um, so Barb Hi, everyone. unmuted. And let me unmute Nanita. And I'm looking for Yvette. I don't see that she, she may not. Have yeah, I don't think she was able to join us. So Barb and Nanita now have open lines so they can contribute to um, to the discussion. Great job, Terry and uh, Sue. Um, I think you brought up a lot of interesting topics. Um, I definitely think that uh, a lot of people don't feel or don't recognize all the rewards of doing a pediatric um, nephrology nursing career um and you know you spoke well of i remember uh, going to one of my patients weddings i remember going to uh, a birthday party or a, 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 all these celebrations and i also remember all the negative things like having the pu puberty sex talk um kind of thing come up but <laughs> <laughs> and I bring that up because, you know, those are uncomfortable things and you don't typically do that in an adult situation, but those are things that you do when you're in a pediatric um, role and, and they are rewarding. You do participate on a greater level and, um, and I know a lot of people fear it for that, maybe for those reasons alone, but it's a very rewarding experience. I think one of the really fun things about this job too is when after they transition to adult care, then they come back and they say, hey, I'm, I'm married now, or I have a kid now and this is my kid, or hey, I just got a job across the street and I'm doing well, I, I graduated from college, and or just to ch check in and say, you know, I'm doing I, okay. I'm doing okay. And I, that means so much to us when they stop in and make the extra effort, because it's not like we're, close by anything, but they're making the extra effort to check in with us because I really believe we, we make an impact in their life and hopefully positive more than negative. This is Celeste. Um, we don't have any questions, but um, everyone who's on the line, if, if you have a question, you can type it in or you can click the raise your hand and I can unmute you so you can ask your question verbally. Um, so we'll we'll give you guys a few more minutes to to try to do that. Um, let's see. No, nothing coming through. Well, maybe while we're waiting for questions, I'll share another oh, story. Oh wait, we, we actually we have somebody. Hold on one second. Okay, Brittany Moore. Right. I'm gonna unmute you, Brittany. Brittany, you're now unmuted, and you can go ahead and ask your question. So we're actually thinking about. Can you hear me? We can hear you. <laughs> um, we're actually in the process of starting up a pediatric dialysis unit. 
and um, we currently, of course, have adults. So I'm in the process of just trying to figure out exactly what we need to get. And like, of course, you know, we're probably going to start with CRRT. And um, I guess as the need comes for hemodialysis, we'll start that. But is there any um, information or any things that you would give that would help us as we transition to doing pediatrics? Are are you thinking? Well, I can I can tell you I opened up a unit here in Orlando, what eight years ago. Um, and it's an arduous process. But are you talking acute or outpatient? Mainly acute, um, because we really you know like you said like it's not really a huge need for outpatient at the time. We already have a hospital that already does that in the area, so it would mainly be for acute. Well, I mean, if you're looking for resources, I can volunteer myself, um, but, uh, you know, and, and provide you with my email and all that for information. Um, but when it, you know, in terms of machinery and things like that, I could get into more detail. Terry, Sue, any input on that level? Um, um, go ahead. Yeah, we uh, this is Minnie. Provide our email. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Nanita, please. Okay, yeah. I just wanted to let you know I did start help start a dialysis uh, children's hospital dialysis uh, unit at in Dallas, and basically we're only acute, so uh, you could use me as a resource. But basically, do you have any nurses cross trained in pediatric nephrology? Not quite, but I have several nurses that are willing to um, start the training um, for the pediatric portion. Okay. I, it, my experience is uh, dialyzing patients that are 20, well, 40 to 60 kilos, that are almost like small adults, mm -hmm. are the best start, you know, not really the challenging ones that are less than, you know, 10, 20 kilos. Those are a little bit more challenging for a new center. So um, basically um, getting, you know, established and doing those younger children first would be a good um, experience as, because they can talk to you. They can, um, you know, pretty much. Um, are you also a children's hospital or are you? Yes. Um, oh, good. Oh, yeah. So you have your resources there since you have already uh, pediatric nurses. Correct. That are also going to be, you know, partnering with you with the, with the treatment. Yes. Yeah, so if I can have you guys email um, at some point. That would be appreciated. You know, all of our all of our names are at the beginning of the um, this webinar, and you can find our email information on the A and A Connect. Correct, Celeste. Yes, that that is correct. Um, you can find them on A and A Connected for sure. Um, okay, so Brittany, I'm going to mute your line. Thank you for your question. We'll definitely make sure that you get their contact information. And I'm going to unmute Brenda Sanders. Hold on one second while I do that, and then I will let you know. Brenda Sanders, thank you for your patience. Um, you are now unmuted. However, it looks like when I unmuted you that your computer um, doesn't necessarily have a speaker. I don't know that we're going to be able to hear you. So um, go ahead and type your question down in the question tab below, and then I will uh, be sure to uh, read that when I get it. Brianne Jamin, I'm going to unmute you so you can ask your question. Oh, same thing. She's not able um, to speak. Let me uh, go to their questions. Hang tight. Okay. Hold on a second. Hmm. Let's see. Um, Kristen Stocker says uh, PCRRT is a great resource for pediatric CRRT stuff. Um, Brianne Jamin says, is there a group on the ANNA website or any other website that we can go to on a regular basis for questions down the line? Well, I can just chime in and say that in ANNA Connected, there's a pediatric spin community. That would be a great spot to ask questions. Um, am I right, Susan and Terry yeah. Barb? That would be a, yeah, a great agree. spot for her. So Brianne, um, if you're not right. familiar with ANNA Connected and how that works, you can send me an email, find me, um, or we'll follow up with you after to kind of walk you through how you can ask questions there. Um, Kristen Stalker says the Peds DeVita Unit in Chicago sends nurses to teach non-Peds dialysis nurses how to do Peds dialysis. That's very interesting. 
Um, wow. Okay, so those are all of the questions that have come in at this time. Um, yeah, there's nothing else in the queue. Well, we just really want to thank you all for attending our webinar. And Celeste, thank you so much for your help. Please feel free to reach out to us. That's what we're here for. Um, a and &A Connected and Celeste will get emails out to people that requested our email information. But we want, we're in this journey together. So let's support each other um, as we care for our precious patients. Thank you. Thank you, I everybody. Wanted, I wanted you all to invite you all to our pediatric spin networking session. It's uh, session 174. If you're going to the Anna Symposium, it's on Monday afternoon. And what is the title of that talk? It's called um, All I Ate Was a Hamburger. And it talks about the, um, uh, the how to take care of patients that develop hemolytic uremic syndrome. Uh, and this is Celeste. I'll also note that if you can't make it to the symposium, we record all of the sessions and they're posted in the ANNA online library and you could um, you can purchase access to sessions that are of interest to you later. So if you won't be able to join us in Dallas, just keep um, keep a lookout for an email that comes from ANNA a few weeks later letting you know that content's available and you can access it later. All right. Uh, Susan, anything else to add before we close out? I don't think so. I just, again, thank you, everybody. Thank you. All right. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you for your participation. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.